Welcome back to the iCoach Kids podcast. Today we have a very, very special guest, author of the Young Athletes Perspective Talent Development Stories, What They Want and Need. We have Dr. Graham Turner with us. Hi, Graham. Hi, Gary. Thanks for having me. It's great, great to be on the podcast. Um, if you're watching the video version of this podcast, you can probably tell that Graham is in Australia, but I'm sure that is a still image in the background and you're not in the middle of the desert. No, that's right. I, I did actually take this photograph in the middle of the desert on the back of a camel. But no, I can assure you that you'll probably just see the chair behind me. I'm, I'm back at home now. So yeah, there won't be any interruptions. I'm not likely to fall off a camel during the podcast. <laughs> oh, um, let's dive into straight away what has inspired you to explore the stories of athletes in, in talent development. Yeah, sure. Well, I've had um, a pretty long career now in talent development. Um, just going back right in the beginning when I was a, a student myself um, back in England, that was actually before the days of the uh, Premier League academies. And I did my um, undergraduate dissertation with the School of Excellence at Lillishall, where there was one um, equivalent of an academy for the country. So I was really interested then learning about um, young people, young athletes, their journeys and, and what took them to be able to progress. Um, and as time's gone on, yeah, I've worked in various capacities. Um, as you know, Guy worked at Leeds Beckett University in sports coaching. Um, started my career in sports coaching with professional football. My first club was Wolverhampton Wanderers, where I began as a, as a technical coach. I had a, a dual role there back in the day, as I say, before the academies. That was where everyone mucked in and did a bit of everything. Um, so, yeah, went from, from football went into sports coaching at the university and um, had a little dabble in strength and conditioning coaching as well. Eventually made my way out um, to Australia where I've worked in various roles now. I worked in the Northern Territory Institute. Um, that's the Northern Territory there where we've got to be honest in Uluru. Well, there's a bit of a distance between the two. Um, worked there as a skill and behaviour consultant and then had a, had a role with Gymnastics Australia as their National League coaching manager. And more recently, I've been working as a coaching consultant and then athlete development lead at the Australian Institute of Sport. So a long time in sport and predominantly working with um, young performers, helping them through the talent pathway. And I guess that there's a uh, there's a couple of things that that coincided that inspired me to write the book. Um, one was becoming a parent. Um, which we've we've shared our conversations. You're a little bit behind me on that learning journey, Gary. Um, but yeah, once you're a parent, you start to see it from your children's perspective, and that gives you something else to think about. And there was a particular story um, that's in the introduction to the book um, that relates to a learning with me from a son. So this was where my son was at. Um, He'd signed to a professional football club when he was uh, um, an under nine and he managed to progress and he was still in at the uh, age of 13. And at the end of the season, his review told him, yeah, you do, you're doing OK. And um, we'd like to invite you back. We'll make sure you keep yourself fit over the summer. Now, by this time, as I said, his dad had worked in a few different capacities and thought he knew a little bit about what was required to become an elite performer. So that's where um, the danger of the parent comes in, um, where my conversation with my son was, oh, that's no problem, mate. You've got a perfect person here to help you. I'll, I'll keep you fit. I'll show you what you need to do. Um, so took him out to the field and introduced him to his first ever go out um, interval training. Like, why the hell would you do that? with a 13 year old anyway you know I just think back and think what are you what you're thinking but anyway um he needed to keep fit and this is how I was get this is how the pros did it you know so I was going to show you how to do it anyway um let's just say wasn't really impressed he didn't really enjoy that um and by the time he got his breath back and he got up his words were me his words to me were I'm never doing that again so uh then of course what we all talk about the car journey as we were just on our way back home. Um, so the car journey went the other way around. 
Um, and and the quote that I always remember that sticks with me from my son was when I was explaining to him and showing my wisdom about what he needed to do and if he wanted a player to be a player, you know, this is the mentality he was going to need. Um, and he said to me, Dad, you just don't understand the mentality of a 13-year-old. And that's the quote that, that sticks with me. Um, so I had a choice then, didn't I? I could tell him, no, he needed to see it like me. Or I could just think about that. Um, and I did, and I'm I'm really fortunate. Now, there's another part of this story you may have had a little insight into, Gary, but I've talked about my book a few times, but I've never actually um, included this part. I had an experience where I'd got an injury, and it was a, a, a significant injury. Um, but it re- when it began, it seemed very insignificant, a foot injury. Um, and as I was seeing medical practitioners, they were advising me on what it was and what I needed to do when I was following all the instructions. And I was going backwards rather than going forwards. And this went on for 18 months, two years. And during this time, I was going to see a lot of experts who were all telling me what the problem was and what I needed to do. And I just felt like there was something wasn't right. They didn't actually know what it was like for me in terms of the way they were talking about this. Now, it's quite a long story short. There's a really simple explanation of why there's a disconnect there. And that's because early on in the piece, when I'd been sent for an MRI scan, a doctor wrote down the wrong foot. Now, no one knew this. Okay. But from that point on, every time I went to see a consultant, they looked at my scan and they said, nah, we can see the problem, but it's just a bit of information. It'll be fine. They were actually looking at a scan of my other foot which did I have a bit of inflammation because I was compensating for my far more serious problem on my right foot. And the advice I was being given in terms of what I needed to do to rehab my foot was exactly the opposite advice that you would give to someone if you knew exactly what they had wrong with their foot. So I was actually um, on the end of a lot of experienced people, a lot of highly credentialed people passing on their wisdom to me Um, but it just didn't, well, it just wasn't what I needed and they hadn't really understood correctly. They didn't really have a clear picture of the position I was in. So I introduced that because I guess I was in a different stage philosophically, the way I thought about things. And so that's, I believe, what led me to be able to shift the mindset from going from more of a sports science view into, no, actually... If I'm thinking about experience, then what is it about that experience that maybe I don't understand because I'm not at that age? I've never actually been as good as my son was at football. So he's definitely seen it differently to me. And where it taught me to was, you know, what about if instead of regarding ourselves, the adults as the experts, what if we regarded the young person as the expert on their life and what their experience was like? And if we could do that, if we could listen to them and get them to contribute to what our understanding will be about what might help them, then if we're on the same page, surely that's going to help us to be in a better place to support them, isn't it? So that was that was the inspiration behind it, and that's where I where I set off on the journey. I guess that that's that's super interesting, and thank you for sharing your personal experience as well. That have that led you to a let's call it a moment of enlightenment when when the experience with your son, but also the experience that you were having with regards to your your own medical care. It's interesting, right? Because obviously on the front of your book, it, it says your name, you're the author, but within your work, you describe the athletes as your co-collaborators. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about that and the value of the, of the young person's voice in also being part of their own their own authorship to their stories yeah for sure well i guess it's important to say that um the book is a deliberate um output that's based upon a phd behind it so i decided to commit to a rigorous rigorous long-term academic process to to look at this Um, in terms of the book i wanted to have an output that was user-friendly um that i thought could could engage um, people who support young athletes. So that might include parents, that might include coaches, it might include a range um, 
of people. Yeah, so I've just lost my thread there, sorry, in terms of... <laughs> it, it's okay, just going to back to the, the side of the athlete's voice and, and why that is, why that's so important. Oh, yeah. So when I had the idea in terms of let, let's look at the lived experience of young people, actually there were quite a few sports um, who, were, who were quite keen um, and we said, oh, you could come and do this for our sport with our athletes. But I made a conscious decision that now actually um, I'm doing this for the good of young people rather than for the sport. Um, so what I want to do is make it young person specific rather than sport specific. So that's why actually all the young people in my book, um, boys and girls, different sports, the most important thing for me was to, to get a good range to see if we could understand some commonalities in, in what this experience was like for the young person. So it was always going to be for me to be able to just explain the concepts to young people and see if they wanted to buy into it and, and come along with it. Um, and actually, that didn't go very well in the beginning, because as you might imagine, um, I had these ideas about how I thought it would work. At that point, I was thinking, you know, social media is really, really big part of young people's lives and they're sharing the kind of influences and the, the experiences they're having. Um, wouldn't it be wouldn't it be a great idea to actually draw upon what they're sharing anyway? So I went through a process of getting ethical approval to get um, a space online where I could connect the different uh, individuals in the program and share information that they were putting out there. Had a meeting with the young people. Um, they all said, yeah, we're happy, we'll do that. Gave them, gave them six weeks to do it. And I get a very, very minimal response. So that was a learning straight away. You know, I'm this person who they don't really know. They haven't really got a motivation to do something for me when they when they post something. It's not for me. It's for, it's for them and and their friends. So that grounded me. That took me back to the young people who were, who were left who came to the second meeting. And so in terms of co collaboration, that's why I just put it to them. Okay, this doesn't seem to have gone very well. I need I need you to to advise me on what's the best way to do this. So this is where I often say there's no there's no rocket science in, in my PhD because what they said to me was, well, why don't you come see what we do and then ask us about it? Simple as that. Now, that posed some, posed some challenges in terms of the young people and the way that they um, live in, in, in a temporal nature um, because they don't do emails. Um, ironically, ethical approval required that I did not communicate with young people on their phones. It required me to send them emails. What that meant was I turned up to quite a few meetings with no one meeting me because they didn't open their emails. And even if they did open their emails, they opened it on their phone, which was quite um, <laughs> amusing. Um, anyway, as time went by, what I was really deliberate about was impressing upon the young people that there was going to be no no judgment made on them at all about this process so i wasn't um connecting with them to try and work out how why if they were talented i wasn't trying to predict how good they were and how good they might be all i wanted to find out was what was it what's it really like to be you in this experience and i gave them an assurance that it's a confidential process I won't share it with um, our conversations with your parents, your coaches, or your teachers. If you want to come one on one and talk to me, you can. If you if you want to bring a friend because you don't know who I am and you what's all this about, you can do that. So over time, we built up this this um, trust, I guess. And then what happened was I, I was quite fortunate because I was actually in the midst of my family moving over to Australia. My family went ahead. I was left in in England to be able to continue with my data collection. And so what would happen is I might have, an, have a meeting. I remember a meeting with Ebony, the netball player, and uh, she said, oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you, I've got, a, I've got a, um, a game tonight if you want to come. I'd be like, yeah, sure, where is it? So she'd say, yeah, it's, uh, it's about an hour and a half away. 
I'm like, yeah, no problem, I'll come. So I just respond to it straight away. Then um, I might get a message off um, one of the athletes Sunday morning. Oh, I forgot to tell you about this. Um, I've got a trial this morning. Um, it's a regional trial. So again, you know, it's probably over an hour away. Um, it starts at 10 o'clock if you want to come. I'll be like, yeah, I'll come. So all of a sudden I started to, to react just the way that young people think in terms of, oh, yeah, I've just remembered this. There you go if you want to, if you want to know about it. Um, so I, I just turn up. Um, and what I'll be doing is, again, no judgment. Um, I take video, I take photographs, and then I'd arrange to meet them after. Um, and what I do is just talk to them about, okay, so what was going on there then? Um, so I was going in with no agenda. In other words, I'm not trying to find out about this specifically. I'm not trying to find out about what what this person said specifically about something else. So just um, this took took a bit of training actually because you have to you have to try and um, what we call bracket your bias. Um, so for example, I might open a conversation with yeah, how are you doing? What's going on, Planet George today? Then, in other words, yeah, just tell me. Tell me what's what's going on. So that was that was the process, um, and what it meant was, yeah, I went to competitions that the athletes were competing in. I went to the training sessions. Um, I was party to meetings that they might be having. I'd just be turning up like the the, the people to do with the sports um, would probably just thought I was a parent sitting in the background. Um, and so that, that's how it went. And in, in relation to okay, so what is it? What is it like? What I um, aspired to achieve was a true representation of the each young person's experience. Um, and that's where it came down to, okay, the, the best way to be able to do this is to tell a story, to use the words of the young people, um, to have them um, check and challenge and have a look to see, yeah, does this actually reflect how you felt about what was going on at the time? So that's, that's what I achieved. And in terms of um the production of the book that's that was what was important to me rather than go down the usual scholarly output route where you reduce your results i was able to um self publish the book which had the stories in um, as they were originally written in their their full format i guess it's it to me it sounds like a real position of privilege to be able to almost be a fly on the wall as these children experience those different things that they're experiencing in their settings and, and even just to have the opportunity to be invited into their world and mm. just just really soak it up and and I guess that that could be really challenging for a for a coach or a club or an organization to consider how they how they do that free of judgment and free of bias um how they do that through listening and not speaking because coaches are doers and they often yeah. want to do too much doing. Um, so I guess in, in a moment, we're going to jump into some of the, the vignettes that you've shared throughout your book, but I would really encourage our listeners, especially those who, um, who are in coaching or who are coaching to really consider what these stories might mean for them and their practice and, and the strategies that they might take to understand the young people that they work with better. Um, and, and I guess we should then jump into, we're going to jump into three of the stories briefly. Um, and, and the first vignette that you shared was called, uh, sorry, that we're going to draw on today is called Finding a Way um, around a young athlete dealing with lots of different pressures that, and, and balancing those pressures. Um, would you mind just just sharing a, a a part of that story for us? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, the athlete name in the book is is Laura. So she was a gymnast, um, women's artistic gymnastics. She was um, about fifteen at the time of the book. She was doing well, so she was um, looking forward to going to national um, competitions. But I guess you might say what you'd expect, not only the development, she'd hit hit um, a, a bit of a plateau with some of a skill progression. Um, and there was a whole mix of things going on there. I mean, she'd had years of commitment 
Um, you know, one part of the book is called A Difficult Life. So she'd she'd obviously been talent ID'd early. Um, her coaches had thought that she got a lot of promise. Um, her coaches hadn't told the different, but she said to me, Yeah, and I my coaches used to used to think that I would be really good, but I can tell that they don't anymore. Um, so there's an insight into the non-verbal communication that athletes can pick up from athletes and the way that they feel they're perceived, whether that's right or wrong from the coach. Um, and in particular, this was about some some skill learning where there was some jeopardy involved because um, these, these were difficult somersaults where if you got it wrong, there's a good chance you're going to hurt yourself when, when you're landing. Um, and yeah, in terms of tr um, finding a way, this was someone who was definitely persevering, definitely showing resilience, but didn't feel like the coaches were helping and didn't actually feel like the coaches really understood what it was like for her to be in that position. And one of the, one of the quotes that sticks with me from that story is coaches can be quite difficult people. Um, and, I, and I guess the athletes learn what kind of conversations they can have, which coaches are open to certain conversations and which aren't. Um, and this athlete, yeah, just talks us through the example of when she was trying to prepare, prepare for a competition and, and just knew that there was some difficulty there and had some real um, reservations about entering the competition. You say a privileged position, you know, I, I can even remember during that time where she said to me, yeah, I'm thinking about quitting, but um, I haven't told anyone else. So she was just telling me at that time um, and, and what that what impressed upon me. And that's where you come from the, the theme of the story. Well, she didn't want to quit. She still actually had a belief in her ability to progress. She still did believe that she could um, be a high level athlete. She could definitely progress from where she was. She just felt that um, she needed perhaps a coach who, who understood in a different way how they could help her. Um, and, and it's a feature of females um, compared to males in that um, females will be more agreeable. So they'll go along with things that they don't necessarily think are the best way. They'll um, perhaps be have more sensitivity to um, negative emotions. So they might pick up on things and, and be affected a little bit more. So, yeah, she I went to the national competition with her. Um, she predicted that she would fall on a tumble. She was correct. She fell on her tumble. Um, and so, yeah, just sharing that that emotion with her. Um, but she she was sticking with it. And, and in fact, what she was trying to do was she was trying to find a way to help the coaches learn how they could help young people. And a feature of that story, um, you know, we, we know that with females, the rate of drop off from sport participation from 13 once they're they're, they've entered and they're going through puberty is really high and in that environment she talked about how there weren't many athletes have have her age left so that was another challenge um, and she'd say well coaches they know how to speak to the young athletes they don't really know how to speak to teenagers so again another example of coaches um you know in a different in a different sport you might have a, a coach who has an age group but in a sport like gymnastics, you can have a coach who stays with an athlete for a high number of years. And so there are challenges there in the transition. And if the coaching remains the same in terms of how they interact and deal with the athlete, when the athlete is actually now becoming a young adult, finding a new identity for themselves, wanting to have some autonomy and to make some choice about how things go, there's the challenge for the coach, you see. that that's That's the space where I think the, a reader of the story can can perhaps get some insight from the other side into what it's like for that young athlete and how they might need to stand back and think, well, okay, what could I do a little bit differently? What might I need to change? I, I love that that um, that moment in the book where the where the the young athlete says, "I I want to help the coach learn about these things and learn new things." And I, I do wonder how, how different coaches would respond to that conversation. Um, I, I know for me personally, it would be a shock. Like it, it, 
Mm. It would be, and, and that's a good thing, right? That shock is a good thing, or it can, it certainly can be. But I, I wonder how coaches can best create that safe space so young people can come to them and and put that out on the table. Yeah, yeah. And what I'll throw in there is there's a lot of, of uh, evidence coming out now about the light, the rising levels of anxiety in young people. Um, and so the young person of today is not the young person of, of 10 years ago or, or definitely not 20 years ago. Um, now, at first, people were, were putting this down to um, the pandemic and lockdowns and the lack of interaction. But it's becoming much clearer that this is to do with the advent of social media and the smartphone. Um, and what we've got is a real overprotection of young people in real life and an underprotection in the virtual world. And so young people these days haven't had the same free um, play in childhood to learn to make, break, resolve, make up with their relationships, how to problem solve, how to manage risk. There's been a lot more constraint and safety precautions made. And, and that does impact. And if you look at the stats coming out now in terms of um, generation alpha, the rise in the, the, the levels of anxiety. We're, we're dealing with young people who see things differently and they interact in a different way. They pick up differently on cues. They're much more um, conscious of um, comments and feedback. And so there's a real need, I believe, to, to bear that in mind. We can't, it's no good a coach thinking, well, this is how I've done it and this has been successful because the young people who we're dealing with today are, are different. There, there's some different needs there. And, and I guess just, and I, I don't mean to, to twist the findings of, of, of your work, but I, I guess in, in light of the, the story that you've just told there, that because these people, these young people are having a very different experience of, of, of life that maybe we did um, at, at different points in time, the experiences that they're having now, not only managing in-person interactions, but that virtual and meta world or what, whatever the hell it's called these days, but they're becoming expert impression managers. Whatever they put out there is to try and elicit a positive response. Is that a fair, is that a fair thing to say? Whether that be from a, a coach, I'm trying to impress you in a way that we, we build a positive relationship or whether that be on social media where it's the I'm putting a post out there to be celebrated, not to be, not to be scolded. Um, yeah. And I, I guess uh, across a few of your stories where you've shared the social media posts that are quite celebratory, that's somewhat the opposite of the, the lived experience that's going on within their reflection. Yeah, for sure. You're right. I mean, it was a big theme that came out of my learnings we, we might call it impression management. Um, in the academia, it's called self-presentation. But yeah, you're right. It's about the way that young athletes learn to manage the impression that is formed by others of them. And ironically, um, what my findings showed was that is the one thing that young people in a talent development program will get good at. Because... Entry relies upon being judged, so they've already been judged. Um, then they go in, and what they realise is, okay, so I'm under constant scrutiny. They'll look to see um, who are the important people who are watching, when do they watch, what do they look for, and how can I respond to that to ensure that I make a favourable impression. And going back to the, if I just draw a little bit from the evidence base, um, the studies have shown that this happens at around, first of all, before sport, um, four or five years old. And there are studies of um, young children being put in a room with a load of nice um, candy or cake, um, and just, on the first of all, on their own and, and being, being told, there you go, um, while you're here, you can just have, have some of the food if you want. And they just took in and they eat all the food. And then what they do is they put the same young child, not straight away after, we don't wanna um, encourage obesity, but um, a little while later, they put the same child back in the room. There you go. There's the same food. But actually, there's another child with you now, and, and their behavior changes. 
and already because they're learning that oh actually someone else is here and they're observing my behavior and so i don't want them to think that i'm eating all the food when they can't have any so the way i behave changes so we see it from that time and then what we see is going up to about 10 years of age the primary motive for this behavior is likability ingratiation in other words I i'm behaving in a way um that i think will help me to be liked by you okay but then once we get past 10 that's where the goal orientation starts to kick in and we start to have um those personal objectives and motivations so then it'll be much more about me demonstrating to you what i can do so this is my ability this is my competence this is this is my potential um and and yeah just one of the stories you've got an example of an athlete there who who talks about um being really clear on who is um opposing person is in the in the talent pathway and knowing the weaknesses in his opponent's game and actually exposing them deliberately so that whoever's watching will be able to see that that other person isn't able to do that and that advantage is them because they're they're playing to their strengths so it is a real key factor and here's here's a challenge you know we think okay we need to have authentic communication um we quite often now people say well um people need to be vulnerable in their conversations um and psychosocial development is an integral part of the development of, of the young person inside sport and outside of sport so it's going to be happening there's no way it's not going to happen it, it, it's important to us as adults you know if we want to get a job we go and impress people that's the way it works but in terms of where it can get to and and that vulnerability let's make no mistake about this we're dealing with a power dynamic so the, the person of lesser strength, so that's the athlete compared to the coach, is always going to be thinking about, OK, I'm not the one who makes the decisions. This other person's got all the power. So I, I need to make sure that I'm giving them what they want. And it happens to the highest level. Just recently in Australia, um, if you watch any Aussie rules where the, there's a lot of um, collisions in midair, a lot of concussion, and there's there's been reports where players are admitting that they're afraid of um acknowledging that they've got some symptoms of concussion because they feel not only will that affect their ability to be peaked going forwards but it'll also also affect their ability to win a new contract and if you want to take the the ultimate um recently in australia in rugby league there was a pre-season camp where obviously the players weren't as conditioned as they would normally be. They came back, they were put into a really grueling session. It was really high temperature. Um, and there were there were three players who succumbed to heat stroke. And one of the players um, actually didn't survive. So there's been headlines about that in terms of, you know, we need to be able to have authentic conversations and open relationships. But that's demonstrating at the highest level, like athletes will feel as though they need to comply with what's requested of them. So if you if you take my example uh, in the book, you've got examples of players. Uh, one, one male athlete in, in particular had a had a bit of an injury and um, talks about how he told the coach he got the injury. And but they, they were in a fitness session and the coach said, yeah, OK, that's fine. Um, well, so don't don't. Um, aggravate it but don't use that as an excuse not to do it so of course the athlete felt like well i better do it then and um, the result is the athlete said yeah i i think i made it worse um, and of course then the question is well why did you do that then if you you know you knew you were making it worse why did you do it and it's like well you don't want to look silly in front of the coach you know um so what the athlete means by by silly is you you don't want to make a bad impression so there's that pressure and, and make no mistake if you're in a talent development program you've committed to it that's hard that was one of the things that comes through the, from these stories what's it like it's hard work um, and in terms of the commitment it's not just about when you're there it's about outside it and this is happening from a really young age and so 
that uh, that ability to be able to start to open a conversation and share power to be confident to say actually um perhaps i need to have a chat with you about something because maybe i've got something that i'm finding difficult that could be physical that could be a, a mental health challenge you know it, it's crucial because ultimately um the, the stakes are high um, I, I've given you, and you know, the worst case example with a professional athlete. But what we see with young athletes is the um, the overload, the um, overuse injuries, and even the burnout at young ages, just because of how long and how many hours people people are putting in. I think it's it's really interesting about this about this idea of the power dynamic and. I, I recall um, when doing a little bit of research in football around 10 years ago now, going and speaking to a load of um, a load of players going through that transition um, from in football, that would be foundation phase to youth development phase. So they're, they're around about 11 and 12 years old. And when asking about what their feelings are about their particular football clubs or about their academies, they're all saying things like, it's a privilege for me to be here. It's an honour for me to be here. And to a certain extent, that that rings true. But I, I wonder if that's also appreciated from the other side of the coin, which is, well, actually, it's a privilege for the club to have a young person who is willing yeah. to commit themselves and work hard and just go through, go through the stresses of not only growing up, which is already pretty hard, but growing yeah. up in, in that environment too. And... And it, which, which leads me to to kind of my, my next kind of line of inquiry, which is you, you mentioned about this importance of self regulation and goal directed behaviour within the book, and um, and that's that's really hard for for athletes to develop, right? To to develop those self regulatory skills, it's getting harder and harder for young people, or it, it appears to be, um, in a world that is increasingly externally regulated um and you touched upon earlier about that story about children don't play as much anymore they don't get as much free play to be able to yeah. negotiate with each other and, and do all of those things um but yeah i i, I guess how, how then do these young people develop these skills these self-regulatory skills these impression management skills to be able to cope in these settings and sorry, this is the most long-winded question you've probably ever received. <laughs> but are are they developing these things as a coincidence, or are they being supported to develop these skills in an appropriate way? Well, the, of course, what we know is um, the best athletes who achieve the highest level um, are the are the best self-regulators. So they're they're the best at learning how to learn. Now, do they actually really understand how they do that? Maybe not. Um, but if they're effective, if they've got good habits, then that's a great place to start. So yeah, definitely within those programs, they'll be they'll be um, they'll learn about how to learn. But in terms of the design of the programs, that's about whether that's included as a as a core part. So if I say this is um, thinking about thinking. Just throw throw that term in. Um, for a young person to be supported to do that, then that has to be deliberate from a coach. Um, and what what you might routinely see is at the end of a session, you might just have a, a bit of a chat. This is why it's actually harder for a team sport athlete than an athlete in an individual sport because they're not going to get the same amount of one-on-one -on -one time with their coach. So if at the end of a session, a coach is saying, okay, what went well today? What wasn't so good? Um, what was the highlight? That that kind of information. Then that, that's getting people to think about um, and reflect on what they've been working on and where they need to go. But in terms of the self-regulatory process, that's pretty routine. The, the missing piece, because that's um, what we might call, I'll use the word reflection. It's after we've had a learning episode. So we might call it um, afterthought. 
For me, the key is forethought. So the link between the reflection or the afterthought and then the forethought going into the next learning episode. And what we know is our memory is going to be selective. We've got bias. We've got preferences. So there's going to be um, some value in relation to doing that in a casual, informal way. But if we want to be really deliberate about it and we want to actually look at progression over time, that's where we've got to have um, something that's more structured in relation to um, our, our goal setting, whether it's the strategies that we're putting in place to, to help us to achieve our goals, then it's looking at, well, okay, how are we actually monitoring that? Because quite often you, you'll see um, an athlete, you might bring something their to their attention. Now, if it's a centimetre ground sport, you've got an advantage there because you've got, you've got clear benchmarks that you can refer to. If it's a decision-making sport, um, and you're not collecting the same data, then it's not so easy. But you might draw the attention of an athlete back to, oh, remember when? When that happened and you were seeing that? Actually, now in this other situation, you've done much better there. Um, but that's not necessarily going to be enabled if you haven't got some, some structure to it. So the environment's important. The learning environment is to how it encourages that and how it um, supports a young person to manage and take control of that. And then how they're able to adapt and prioritize long-term development. So I guess in terms of a young person becoming proactive in their own learning, taking control of that learning journey, um, becoming self-aware, um, learning to exert greater control over their thoughts and emotions, that's what's required. But in the same way that we, we talk about a coach, if you want to um, – get the best results, then you need deliberate practice. Then a young person needs to be um, supported to understand, well, what does deliberate practice look like for me? Now, if I take you back to the the example with with the um, my son when I took him for running, okay? Now, by the time he's 18, guess what? He's doing interval training on his own because he wants to do it, and now he understands the purpose of it. Of course, if I'd have gone to the evidence base at the time, it would have showed me that actually deliberate practice doesn't kick in until, until perhaps around the age of 15, okay? And how, how do we define deliberate practice? Well, we define it as not necessarily enjoyable, which I, I smile because of course, um, it just makes nonsense of what I, I attempted to do. Um, because it was just completely the, the, the wrong age. But I guess if, if we're aware of the science behind how young people learn, and there's lots of information about relative age effect, which is based upon growth and maturation, but we need to be far more concerned alongside biological maturation with what does that mean for their cognitive development? And how does that integrate with their sense of autonomy and how they want to develop choice and ownership and what's the right time to introduce something and again you know we can't go just with age groups males males and females will be different and individuals will be different but it reinforces the, the point to um we we can be deliberate in relation to our thinking about how do we best support self-regulation for a young person and if we look at autonomy for example um Again, what we've learned is to give an athlete who's um, not at the right age and stage a choice actually can be counterproductive because they may find that stressful because then they'll go into the self-presentation mindset of, I'm not sure, so I'm trying to work out what you think would be the best thing for me to do. I, you're trying to give me a choice, but I'm not trying to take a choice. I'm trying to work out what you want me to do. OK, so that's stressful for me. I'd rather actually you give me guidance because I'm not ready for that yet. And actually, if we're able to explain the why, well, I, we'd like in this session, we're going to work on this. And this is why. We've learned that um, that actually supports the autonomy of a young person, because the fact that they understand why they're doing it and then they continue to participate means they have chosen. 
to continue with the option that's been input in front of them. So they have some autonomy there. Now, when we get to an athlete who's a little bit older, they're starting to gain their own sense of identity. If we talk about self-determination theory, the three things, connectedness, autonomy, and competence. When in, in, in talent development, you've got to feel a, a sense of competence um, within that environment. People, people always say to athletes, and this is young or old, be confident. You know, go out there, be confident today. Well, if you don't feel competent, you can't feel confident. So as a coach, it's really important to give the support to enable the young person to develop their confidence, but that's underpinned by their competence. And that's also related to their sense of connectedness in their environment to you and the, the other athletes. So the three things go together. There's not, there's not a simple recipe, but my summary to that would be a coach should be thinking deliberately about how, when and where they give an athlete the opportunity to have a choice. So we might talk about sharing power. You know, how, how do you actually, how does a coach um, give a young athlete the opportunity to provide their opinion and actually demonstrate to the young person that their opinion matters? When a coach asks a young person a question, many times it's not because the coach wants to find out the answer because the coach knows the answer. The coach is trying to find out if the athlete knows the answer that they want them to give. So this is about a coach asking a question because they're curious and actually want to find out something and asking it with a view to having their mind changed about where they're actually going to take the program. I, I find um I find this idea of of autonomy incredibly fascinating, and and I think it's I think it's it's an important thing to discuss around. But I often think the word autonomy is I'm going to say it. It's kind of weaponized by choices, uh, weaponized by coaches. Sorry, to to say oh well, well we we've got the best interest of the athlete at heart because I'm giving them a choice. And I read something probably about seven or eight years ago now, which was a response to Dietrich and Ryan's work. Yeah. Um, that, and I think it was called The Tyranny of Choice. And actually, when when what they did was they dug back into the, the foundations of, of Dietrich and Ryan's work and they said, well, yeah, there is an element of choice in this term autonomy. But actually, autonomy itself is about a feeling of control. Yeah. And those those two things, choice and control, while they are somewhat complementary to each other, they're also distinctly different. And actually, you can give a, a person, a young person, a, anybody, a, a, a sense of control without overwhelming them with picking from a set of choices. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm in control of my own destiny. I'm in control of my learning. I, I am... I am practicing hard. I'm, I'm regulating my behavior. And I've, I've really, um, I've probably overly simplified that a bit there. But, but I think sometimes if, if we frame that idea of, of the autonomy of the young person as, as, a, as a sense of control over what they're doing, that also can help us reframe the, the coaching practices that we do that support the young person at the appropriate times. Yeah. And, one of the things that I say in the book is um, the realization that it's the young person who who controls their destiny. Now, and what I what I mean by that is they may find obstacles in their way, and um, they may find that they're released from a program, but they they then make a choice about what happens next, which transition they want to make. Do they want to make a transition out, or do they want to make a transition somewhere else and and, and keep going? Um, in my experience, not the same again for individual athletes compared to team athletes, because if you're, a, if you're a team athlete, you need a team to be able to play in. If you're an individual athlete, you can um, enter and compete on your own terms and, and, and progress if you're able to. But yeah, for sure. Um, we've got lots of stories, haven't we, of athletes who have been told, yeah, you're not going to make it, you're not going to be good enough, and they, they've proved that wrong. Um, I'm also sure that we've got lots of athletes who definitely could have been good enough, 
but they didn't have the right environment around them and it was all a bit hard and so they made the choice that it wasn't right for them to continue and on that you see i often think take for example an athlete who's been selected into a talent development program and they're they're always the evaluations and the points at which you're going to continue or you know that dreaded term the release um not in my experience is it usual for a coach at a point of transition to acknowledge their part in the process and what i mean by that is if i'm a coach and i um i think back now you know when i was at wolves years ago if I, if i was coaching in the 13s if a co if a boy came in on on trial he'd be with me um for six weeks and it would be my judgment on whether he would come into the program now at the end of that whether it was a year or was signed for two years and and the decision would be made about whether the boy was retained or not um i reflect back on it now and think to myself actually there was some failure on my part there because i've selected a young athlete who i had the belief could progress and I had the belief that I could support to progress. They haven't been able to, so I have to accept some responsibility for that. You know, my, what was my part in that? And for sure, if I was to go back now, I know that I could definitely have supported some athletes better um, if I knew then what I know now. But yeah, in terms of that, that control and destiny, there are a lot of things that are outside the young person's control. Most Most things... Uh, in fact, the only the main time where things are on their terms is at entry, entry to a program, because then um, that's where they hold power because they've been invited and uh, they're, they're trying to be attracted into a program. Once they're in, again, something I talk about in my book, um, whatever sport it is, they're looking for unique individuals. And then there's an irony because they bring you into a program where you, you then conform to a sense set of standards and expectations um so a young person needs to um retain their own identity i would encourage a young athlete to know know what has um enabled you to stand out above other people and, and to keep that in mind because um yes yeah, another feature of coaching programs that can get lost a little bit when you take a young athlete into a new program, when there's so much for them to learn about different things. And so all of a sudden they're adapting the way they perform, the way they play, the way they train and not, not um, perhaps recognizing their weapon, which is what got them there in the first place. So yeah, if again, some advice that, because in the book there's key takeaways and talent development tips, the young athlete has to choose an environment that's right for them. Um, and just because you're in a particular environment for a certain amount of time doesn't mean that um, you should necessarily stay in that environment if you feel that that's not quite working out for you. And that's where we come to a, a relationship with a coach, with a athlete, boy or girl, and also their parents. You know, that, that's where it all has to be taken into account and um, where we put the, the needs of the young person first. And I've chosen to say that deliberately. Uh, the the needs of the young person before the needs of the young athlete because it's the young person who who's going to come out of this that we want to have had a positive experience absolutely that they're a human being first right um yeah. i guess guess for those who are are listening and watching one of the things that we will do is we will put a, a link to um, number one, uh, is we have a quick summary article at iCoachKids.org of some of the stories um, that Graham tells in his book. Um, but also we will put a link to the book itself, um, either in the description on YouTube or the description on, on your uh, relevant podcast provider. Um, so, so please go and check that out. Be before we go, though, Graham, um, one of the things that we ask each of our guests at the conclusion of our conversations is a question that isn't always easy to answer, but we ask it anyway. Uh, and that is, what is good coaching to you? I've got a simple answer to this. Good or great coaching is about how you make people feel. So we've, we know the quote. It's not, people don't remember 
what you said, people remember how you made them feel. So if we think about the experience of being coached, the experience of being an athlete in a program, there can be many different motivations, aspirations, orientations. So it's relative um, to the context. You know, if you're if you're supporting an athlete who's going for a podium event at a pin pinnacle um, competition, then the way you provide their support, their belief, the way you support their motivation, the way you enable them to be technically and mentally prepared, that's critical. But in a different coaching context, where someone's there because they're much more in, orientated to a social connection, they want to have fun, they want to stay active, then the way that the coach makes that person feel about their participation is just as important. So in terms of how you do it, that's much more complicated. But as a simple answer in relation to what I believe a coach should aspire to, great coaching is about how you make people feel. That was beautifully concise. Um, you've done a much better job of that than I would. I'd have probably waffled for about 25 minutes and still not come to a conclusion. Um, Graham, it's been a privilege to have you with us today. Um, and I'm sure we could have spoken for much longer. Um, for our audience, please um, connect with with Graham via via socials. He he's on LinkedIn, um, and also check out his book. It's a it's a great piece of work. Um, but for now, thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you on the other side. <laughs>